introduce you in these types of venues, so thanks, Corbin. Um, Corbin and I sit next to each other at the basketball games, so we're used to giving each other bumps and chest bumps and all kinds of things. Um, well, thanks for having me. This is really fun. I, I did this last year and really enjoyed it um, and worked with Bridger and Scott. First of all, you know, I, I'm sure you guys have gotten to know Scott throughout the semester, but there's not a better human being on this campus than Scott Peterson and or, nor well thought of than Scott Peterson. And I hope all of our prayers will be with him as he recovers. Obviously, the prognosis is good, but anytime you open your cranium up like that, uh, it probably deserves some prayers. So um, hope the best for Scott. So today, I'm gonna, we're going to talk a little bit about my story and the story of Circus Tricks. I'm going to give you our history and tell you how we became a thing. And then we're also going to talk about, to just sort of outline where I'm going to go, we're going to talk about some of the trends and the dynamics that are driving our business because some of those trends are, are some of the leading trends of the economy right now. And where I'm going to take that is to maybe pose some questions for you and hopefully spark some ideas for you about entrepreneurial opportunities, right? That's why you're in this class, I hope, is you are at least open to considering yourself as an entrepreneur. And the way to start doing that is just to take a pose through your education and through life where you are open to opportunities and you're always looking at things like, gosh, I wonder if someone were to do this, or I wonder if this thing existed, how people would respond. So we'll get into there, and, and my goal would be to maybe plant a few seeds for you, because uh, I'm tired, and like I said, I've got plenty of kid stuff to do and, and everything else, so I'm hoping you guys will take the torch on some of these ideas and be entrepreneurs for me. Um, circus Tricks, let me tell you a little bit about Circus Tricks. So Circus Tricks is the largest developer, owner, operator, and franchisor of active recreation parks in the world. What do I mean by that? So trampoline parks, ninja obstacle courses, um, and uh, we, there's a couple other titles we put on what we do, but you get the idea. Um, we're the largest in the world. We have now over 100 what we call owned and operated facilities where we 100% own them. And we have over 250 franchise facilities. So that's where we work with other entrepreneurs and we work with them as entrepreneurs to service them to be in the same business that we're, we're in. And we can talk more about that in, in the questions. Um, does this thing have a laser light? Oh. Which one's the laser light, Bridger, is it? Sorry, I'm challenged. Ah, the top button. Oh, that, okay. That's easy enough. Yeah, well, maybe not. I'll point. Okay. So, give you a little idea of these brands that you see before you. So, Rise, Rise is our brand in Asia and in the UK. It's an international brand for us. Sky Zone is our big franchise brand. Any of you ever been to a Sky Zone? Maybe in your hometown. We don't have any in Utah, but you may, where, wherever you come from, may have been to a Sky Zone. Defy is sort of our, our premier tricking park, all right? These are owned and operated tricking parks. They're our pride and joy. That's where we go all out. Rock and Jump is kind of our, our kids, our kiddie park, kids option. And then Superfly is our German and Eastern European brands, okay? So that's Circus Tricks. Um, and we're gonna come back and talk more about Circus Tricks. Corbin mentioned a few measurables, but none of that's important. We've just, we've been growing fast, right? And, uh, you know, our revenue is almost, this year we will probably hit 300 million a year in revenue. Um, and, uh, with, he already mentioned, we're, we're closing in on 400 facilities. Let me tell you a little bit about my story, just because you kind of have to know that a little bit to understand circus tricks. So my background, Corbin mentioned, I'm a BYU grad, went on to law school, 
and went and practiced law in the Bay Area for a few years. Uh, and I worked, I was there right during the dot-com boom. Uh, 99, 2000, 2001, right when the dot-com explosion was happening in California in Silicon Valley. And I was working in Menlo Park and working with a lot of really fun dot-coms. One of the companies I worked with uh, was this startup, and it, it was really interesting. Uh, the startup was doing some things with money and the internet, and the founder was a guy my age, right? I was fresh out of law school, and I'm working with this guy, and I'm the grunt attorney at this firm, and I'm working 100 hours a week and, and, and just dying. But having a blast, but just killing myself. And um, this entrepreneur I was working with for this company was my age, and he was this interesting guy. He was from South Africa. He'd already had a startup that had done real well that he'd sold, and now he was getting into money. And this company was called X.com. What a great domain, great name. Um, and anyway, so, so we were working with them and ended up merging that company with a co larger company called PayPal. And that young entrepreneur was a guy, any, any guesses? That was Elon, right. And that was kind of one of my inspirations. Elon and some of these other young entrepreneurs I was working with was like, I love being an attorney, I love doing this, but I, gosh, if these guys can do it, I actually want to be an entrepreneur. I don't want to be the guy servicing the entrepreneurs, I want to go do stuff. And that was, that was part of my experience there and part of the inspiration. And so I, I did that, ultimately. I left Silicon Valley, I moved back home to Central California, which is home for me, and I started my own real estate firm and I started doing commercial real estate development. And I was developing office space and industrial space and did that successfully for several years. It was a good time in California to be in real estate. Interest rates were low and there was a lot of expansion. It was, it was too good to be true. And guess what? It was too good to be true. So ultimately, I got hammered in the Great Recession, okay, when the, the market crashed. I had two big projects that I was working on, two, both with big bank loans, was working on those, and overnight, when the recession and the financial crisis happened, and I don't expect you all to remember this, but it was a dark time in real estate. Overnight, literally, both of these big projects I had were what we call underwater, meaning the appraised value of the projects was now lower than the loan that I had on the projects. And when that happens in real estate, especially in commercial real estate, bank auditors don't like that, okay? And you, they take your file and you go down the hall into what's called special assets. Every bank has a, a goon squad, if you will, who's tasked with special assets, meaning the problems. They're, they're, they're tasked with dealing with the problem loans that they have. And I was immediately, along with many other real estate developers at that time, suddenly problem children. And I spent two years of my life basically just trying to work out from under these loans and do workouts with the special assets people at the bank, trying to avoid bankruptcy. And there were I was really at the mercy of these banks. At any time, they could have called these loans, and I would have responded by saying, I'm bankrupt. Thank you very much. And fortunately, you know, that wasn't a good move for them at the time because there were so many of us in trouble that they worked with me. And, and you know, so I, I literally spent two years of my life, didn't make a single dollar, but just work to try to get out from under these loans and I finally did two years later and I avoided bankruptcy and I and by the way part of the you know the lore in our family and our company and what I tell people to this day is whatever I ever accomplish at Circus Tricks my greatest business accomplishment was avoiding bankruptcy during the recession bar none there's nothing that could happen to me the rest of my life that would change that that was the greatest business accomplishment of my life. But I did avoid bankruptcy, which sounded like a good thing, but you know, I'll never forget the day I walked out of the bank on that last loan and I'd, we'd done this, what's called a deed in lieu, where I basically gave the project to the bank and in exchange for that, they, they let me off the hook, right? 
And I never forget walking out into the sunlight, you know, out of the bank that day and going, oh my gosh, what an answer to prayer, what a miracle this is. I, I, I'm not going to have to declare bankruptcy. But have any of you seen Cast Away, the movie Cast Away? One of the great scenes in that movie is at the very end of the movie, you know, he's got that FedEx box that has like kept him alive the whole time and he, it's, it's an address in Texas that he's got to deliver it to. And he finally, you know, gets on land and delivers this box to this family in Texas. And there's this great scene where he's just sort of standing on the road. That was his purpose for 10, you know, years that kept him alive on that island. He, he delivers the package and then he's sitting there on the road going, what next? <laughs> I'm, I'm glad I did that, but now I have nothing to do. I have no purpose or anywhere to go. What, what in the world do I do next? And that's kind of how I felt. Like, I was relieved, but I, I didn't have a job. And there was no prospect at all of doing real estate at that point. Like, the real estate economy was done. And so, you know, my friends and my family kind of, in a nice, tactful way, sort of sat me down and said, hey, Case, this is... This is why you got an education and you have a law degree. So now it's time to get your bar license back active and go practice law. That's why you went to law school and got educated so that you could fall back on that. And that was kind of hard to argue with, right? That does make sense. So I said, okay, you're right. I'm going to get my bar license reactivated. And I, I started taking continuing ed classes. I was gonna go back and be a lawyer. Now, the reality is, it wasn't like law firms were hiring back then either, okay? Um, it was tough in every industry, but that seemed like the responsible thing to do, so off I went. And about that time, um, to kind of cheer my family up, I took my boys, we're big Giants fans, San Francisco Giants fans. We went, I took my boys to a baseball game up in San Francisco uh, to go see the Giants play, and a friend of mine heard we were going up there and he said, hey, while you're there, you ought to go check this place out. They're redeveloping the military base, the Presidio in San Francisco. They're redeveloping it and they've created this trampoline park. And when he said it, I'm like, I, I just couldn't even conceive of what he was talking about, like a trampoline park. Like, I, I have no visual reference at all for what that might even be. And I got online and there wasn't really much online back then. But it piqued my curiosity enough that we went up the night before the game and I took my boys and we went to this place. It was called House of Air. And it's right under the Golden Gate Bridge in an old airplane hangar. And it's this trampoline park. And we walked in and I remember just like being sort of sensory overload and, and being kind of stunned and overwhelmed at what I was seeing because it was this weird mashup of all these different things. Trampolines, obviously, which in its own right was pretty bizarre, right? This whole big hangar full of, warehouse full of trampolines. People were, it was active. People were in yoga pants or in workout clothes. They were sweating, breathing heavy. It was a workout, right? It was social. They were there with friends. We, I could see, you know, teenage groups together. There were some work groups there after work. There were some parents with kids like I was. So there was this social element, and then there was like this aesthetic element too. There was music playing and kind of a design vibe. It sort of felt like a club in there, and I'm like, wow, this is just a weird mashup. And, and it seemed like the appeal was really broad, all these different ages and everything. So long story short is we just had a blast. By the end of the night, my boys and I are playing dodgeball, and we're, you know, we're throwing dodgeballs at the face of complete strangers in this thing and I'm going this is incredible like this is such a unique weird thing long story short is we went to the baseball game the next day and afterwards went back to this place and went again and by the time we left and were driving home from this fun little overnight trip I had decided I'm going to do one of these I can I can figure this out I've developed real estate this isn't brain surgery no pun intended Scott um, I could figure this out, you know, and, um, and so I went home and I started looking for a building and I found one. It's an old carpet gallery warehouse 
industrial warehouse, 12,000 square feet, very small. I didn't know that then, but it turns out really too small for this, but the guy was, was open to renting it to me, so I, it looked great to me, and uh, found a building, and I had to beg, borrow, and do everything in my creative power to get this thing built. I had no money, or you know, I had small savings, and I used every penny of it, brought on a partner for, so that he could put some capital in. I did these just weird, creative deals with different vendors that I would never be able to do today. Like the construction, the guy who built it, the construction guy, I said, hey, here's what we're going to do. You're going to build it, and I'll pay you weekly after we open. Sound like a good deal? And he said, yeah, let's, we'll do that. And I laugh about that now because there's no way I could ever convince anyone to do that now. But back then, during the recession, contractors were hungry too, right? And so you could get a little more creative with people to do stuff like that. My all-time greatest move ever, though, I got my landlord. So the guy who was renting me the building, it's a tradition when you lease space sometimes to get a TI allowance, a tenant improvement allowance, where the landlord will spend some money on typically like on new paint or like bathrooms or things that will increase the value of the building. And in the greatest move, again, just shy, just shy of avoiding bankruptcy, I somehow talked this landlord in to a logic where trampolines were a tenant improvement. And I said, here's what you're gonna do. You're gonna wire 200 grand to the trampoline company for these trampolines. And this landlord was such a cool guy, and, and I, I've had a chance to reconnect with him recently and just thank him, but I can't believe he did that. Like, today, we, we are an A-credit commercial tenant, and I today couldn't get a landlord to do that. And somehow this guy did that for this dude who was, had just avoided bankruptcy and literally had no money, and I, I can't believe he did it. But it was a miracle. <laughs> And that's what paid for those steel frames you can see right there. So anyway, we got this thing going. And I remember sitting down with my wife during this time. And you know, there were no pro formas or really any. There were like less than 10 of these in the country at the time. And so there were no pro formas or really anything to sort of expect or, or model how well this was going to do. And I remember sitting with my wife and saying, listen, here's the plan here. If every, I've, I've made a little Excel worksheet, one page worksheet, if everything goes perfect, I think we can clear 5,000 bucks a month from this. And that would be a miracle. Like this, this would be the greatest blessing ever. And the way we were looking at it, the way I was looking at it was, this can be a bridge, right? While I'm getting my law, my my bar license back active, I'm taking my continuing ed while I'm searching for a job. This could be a small business that might put food on the table for months or a year, or whatever we need to kind of transition into a new career. And that's how I looked at it. It was sort of a bridge between uh, careers for me. And, I, and so that was our goal, five grand a month. When we were done, the whole thing ended up costing me about $430,000 to build out, okay? I still have the spreadsheet. Every penny that we spent, the spreadsheet saying we're gonna make five grand a month. Anyway, so we opened. This is Skywalk. This is the first park I ever did. And that is literally the entire park. This picture was on my phone. I'm sitting in the far corner of the park and, and taking it, and that's the whole thing. There was a, a field of trampolines, a foam pit with some trampolines, and a dodgeball cage over here. And that was it. That is, you're, you see the entire park right now, OK? There's nothing you're not seeing other than the lobby up there. But that was the whole thing. And uh, so we ended up opening. And by the way, I had no money to market because I'd spent every dollar I could just on these trampolines and foam and all this stuff. Had no money. And so someone gave me the idea. They said, well, you ought to join Facebook and Facebook is doing, the, you can create a page for your business, and it's free. 
And I thought, that seems too good to be true. So I, I joined Facebook. And by the way, this is back in 2011. That doesn't seem too long ago. Trust me, no one I knew was on Facebook back then. Like I was the only middle-aged man on Facebook that I knew. And it, the whole thing was a little creepy even, you know, because it was like MySpace had happened and now it was Facebook. And here I was like a pioneer on Facebook and it was a little creepy. Um, but I got on and they were just doing the beta testing for their pages their, at, where you could do a campaign and it was free. And since I didn't have any money, I just, I just created this page and I started posting videos and stuff on here. And that's all I did. That's all I could do for marketing. And I'll never forget, so we opened our doors and two weeks in, it's a Saturday and the day's moving along through the day. It's seven o'clock, eight o'clock, nine o'clock. I'm at home with my laptop and I've got the point of sale software. I can see what we're doing for the day. And my kids are there and my wife and we're looking at it and we're, we're going, oh, it's okay, it's at five, six. And about 10 o'clock that night, second Saturday we're open, we hit $11,000 for the day. And, I'll, and we were like dogpiling in the living room and <laughs> screaming and just going crazy, our whole family. And, and the thought that I had was, we're going to clear our five grand a month. <laughs> it worked. It worked. We're going to do five grand a month. And to me, that was... I could die right there and know my family had five grand a month to put food on the table. So, um, so it was successful and that was, that was great. Um, so that's Skywalk 2011. Now, I want to show you this. This is Flying Circus in Seattle. This is 65,000 square feet, okay? Um, Skywalk was 12,000 square feet. This is 65,000 square feet. And uh, this cost over 3 million bucks to build. Skywalk cost me about $430,000. You'll also notice all the different attractions, and my pointer's not working, but, um, you know, that first picture I showed you was just trampolines. This now, and by the way, this is about a year and a half, two years old for us. This is about 35, 40% trampoline. So it's got ninja courses, slack lines, stunt bags, aerial silks, zip lines, you name it. It's got all of it. So it's, I'm trying to show you sort of the progress from that first one to this. And there's been a lot of progress. And it's sort of diversified away from just trampolines into what we call active four-wall entertainment. Anything we can put in, this, in these facilities that's active, we consider that within our Ballywick, okay? That's what we do. Here's another one. This is in Fort Myers, Florida. That's called a super tramp. Th these are really hot right now. They're extremely bouncy Australian um, tramp trampolines, and there's a whole subculture tricking community that uh, utilize these. It's really fun and they love our parks. This is, what, uh, this is that same park in Fort Myers, Florida, but I wanted to show you this picture. Can you tell from this picture what this building was before it became a Defy Park? How, do you, how can you tell that? The sweet triangle, right? You can tell, it's plain as day, good. I want you to remember that. We're gonna come back to that point and it's very important, but you're exactly right. This is a 35,000 square foot former Best Buy in an inline retail center in Fort Myers, Florida. Okay, that, remember that first one, that Skywalk I did was in an old carpet gallery warehouse in an industrial part of town in Madera, California. Um, so this is a whole new world and Part of one of the opportunities and the ideas I'm gonna run by you, we're gonna come back to this, but remember you recognize that Best Buy signature sign triangle, okay? So th this is us, and, uh, and this is where we are now. We've grown a lot, we've been very fortunate, and you know, I would love to stand up here and say, guys, we've done really well. I'm just really smart. I mean, I'm pretty brilliant, you know? Uh, trampolines, what, what can I tell you? Um, <laughs> But the truth is, is that 
and any of you who are successful as entrepreneurs, you will know, and I know all the successful entrepreneurs in this community, they will tell you the same thing. They were lucky. And I've been very lucky. And when I say that, what I mean is we've had forces and trends at our back that we've been able to ride. It's not because we're smarter than someone else. It's because we happen to be on the frontier of trends that we're developing and we were there early and we were there first and we were able to grow with those trends. So I wanna to talk to you about those trends and what's, what's happening. We're at a point in our economy where things are diminishing in importance and experiences are ascending. The most valuable thing that you could provide in today's economy is an experience. It's not a thing, okay? And this isn't just an opinion that I have. There's hard, good, deep data to back this up, all right? This is a McKinsey study uh, that's actually a couple years old, and the trends in this study are now, this was late, like December 2017, January 2018, and the, this is already obsolete. Like, these trends have continued exponentially. Um, and we're expecting an update to this, but to just summarize it for you and tell you what's happening is growth in spending is happening at a, I want to say it's like now, even beyond the study, over 50% faster than growth in spending on things. Okay, people are spending more money on experiences. And there's a lot of reasons for this. W one of them is just data. Like when I was a kid, my mom used to tell me like, hey, you, things can't buy you happiness. You'll get more happiness by having a neat experience than a thing. That was kind of old ho homespun wisdom. And it turns out that that's true and that there's a ton of data about that now, all right, that shows that if you spend $5,000 on a thing and then you spend $5,000 on an experience, like a trip, for example, would be a, just an example, that your yield on ha in terms of happiness on that 5,000 your yield is going to be greater on the experience. And there's a lot of studies that have deep dove into that and have proven it, and it's kind of understood. And even your generation especially, you sort of instinctively understand that. All right? And so your generation, you value experiences greater than things. All right? You'd rather go do something than buy something. All right? And... As part of that, I'll tell you, this trend of spending more on experiences, this is true in every generational segment. So baby boomers, your grandparents, Gen Xers like me, okay, and millennials and especially, especially Gen Z, which you're part of. So all these segments are spending more on experiences compared to things. But your generation is spending like 40% more on experiences than things, than, the, than even those other segments, all right? So what does that tell you as a trend? As an entrepreneur, what should that tell you? Good. And what, what else does it tell you about the longevity of this trend? It's just starting and it's gonna continue, right? When you see the younger generation exhibiting this behavior even more than the older generation, that ripple is just, is just coming through. And so this is a trend that's gonna continue and everybody knows it. In consumer retail space, everyone knows this. It's all about this. Experiences, experiences, experiences. Most entrepreneurship for the last 50 years has been about coming up with a better thing, a better mousetrap, a better whatever. Those days are probably over, and we'll go into why that's the case. There's a lot of opposition, a lot of adversity trying to do that. The billion dollar companies of tomorrow are gonna be companies that find a way to provide an opportunity to do something, all right? And when we talk about all these things, I should clarify what we're talking about, right? Like, and this is just a sampling. Obviously what we do is experiential. You pay to go have access to this place to jump and do all these physical things. 
but amusement parks would be part of this, live entertainment, concert tickets are through the roof. Any of you tried to go to a jazz game lately? Like the ticket experience at sporting events, the pricing, the experience, it's just, it's so much different than it was a generation ago. Um, the demand is huge. Travel is a big one. There are all kinds of niche travel. You guys Airbnb fans? You guys know what Airbnb just launched last year? What was it? It's their experience side. So now in, in addition to going and going to Italy and finding a place to stay, you can use Airbnb because they know this trend, right? They know where things are going. You can go and find a cooking class in Tuscany or a, go ride a Segway through Venice or whatever it is. And, and these are all things that you, can, that you can do. So it's all about experiences. Restaurants, you may think, well, I go to a restaurant, I buy food because I'm hungry, right? I'm getting a thing. And that's true, but we consider restaurants to be an experiential play as well, because you're usually going there for the experience, all right? You're going there with other people, you're socializing, it's an experience. Okay, here's another reason this is happening, all right? It's, it's this social media world we live in. And I've got a term up here, selling selfies. Anyone know what I mean by that? Yep. Bingo. The most valuable commodity that you could sell in today's economy is a selfie. All right? And what I mean by that is not literally just a selfie, a good post, a good social media post. What do I mean? What makes up a good social media post? Any ideas? Don't pretend you don't know. FOMO, right? Fear of missing out, something that makes your friends jealous. Great answer. Something that makes it look like you have a life, right? That you don't sit around and just eat potato chips and watch TV all day. You want, we're all, in this world of social media, we are all PR agents of our own selves and we are all projecting a life. One of the great terms ever of this generation is living my best life, right? And, and a good post will reflect that, that man, I'm out there, I'm doing cool stuff, and I'm on the beach in, in Bermuda or wherever it is, and I'm doing this and I'm doing that, and you're sitting there going through going, well, man, I just eat potato chips and watch Netflix, you know? That's all I do. And so, but you don't post that. You don't post when you're watching television, right? That's what we like to do, but we're not posting about that because we want to put our best self forward. So posts that are aspirational, okay, that say something about us, now, here's the other thing that Instagram specifically did. Instagram raised the bar on optical production, all right? You don't understand. You guys are born into a very optical world, and Instagram has only made that a million times more so with the filters and the production tools. But when I grew up, we weren't walking around with cameras. A good picture to me when I was a kid was just one that you could see who was in it, right? Now, we live in a graphic and an optically produced world, and so we want good optics. We want good production values. That's why you're all wanting the new iPhone 11, right? Because it's got the high-def camera and the different angles, and you can take better. You're all professional photographers. You don't understand how, as the standards of that go up, our expectations go up with it, right? So we all have high, high... Um, expectations for our social media posting. And that's why we spend millions of dollars on art and color, okay? Every one of our parks. We are the largest employee, employer of large format street art in the world. We've got all these street artists, guys who dropped out of school when they were 13, their parents thought they would be unemployed for the rest of their life. They were spray painting you know, train cars and they're getting arrested for vandalism. Those guys now make big bucks from us traveling the world, painting. 
By the way, this one is one of my favorites. Uh, I'm going to point this out to you so you can get online and look. This is a guy from Scotland. His name is Smug. One word, like Prince, like Banksy. You can look it up. He's like the Banksy of Scotland. You can look him up. That is all spray paint. There's not a single brush stroke in there. That is all spray paint, including those white things on the eyes and the nose. And this guy travels around the world. You can look him up on Facebook. Look up Smug. He's, he's like the man. And this is in Provo. This is actually the old BYU women's gym on University Avenue. If you ever peek in there, you'll see these eyes uh, in the back. This is, and these are some other examples. But we, we put color all over these walls. You'll notice the eyes. We did some studies about, about how where we get the most yield out of our paint color optically. And guess what it is? Eyes per inch of paint. They cast a, a what's the word? They cast a mood over the entire space. And so every one of our parks has eyes of some kind in it. It's a little trick of the trade. They're all different, but they all have eyes. One thing I want you to notice in this one, this is in Orange County. Uh, if some of you have been to Circus Tricks in Orange County, um, you'll notice the ceiling. What color is the ceiling? It's black. Every time we go into one of these old Best Buys or one of these old uh, big boxes, we spend about a hundred grand painting the ceiling black. And every time the landlord comes in while we're doing it, he's like, you guys are such fools. No one cares about the ceiling. Why are you painting the ceiling black? Like that is the biggest waste of money I've ever seen, I can't believe you're doing that. And we just nod and we laugh at them, but we know something that they don't know. And what we know is that every inch of this park, this is our approach, every inch of this park is a photo studio. It's a photo studio for selfies and for posting. And, um, and so we do that, every single part. We're blacking out the background. We want every angle to be a produced optical selfie opportunity. And I'll tell you one last story on this to drive it home. We spent a long time, we were trying to develop a trapeze attraction for our parks. And we actually hired as a consultant an old trapeze artist to come in because it's actually quite tricky. And the reason it's tricky is the geometry, the math in terms of how, how high the platform is, what height the bar is. You want to do the math right so that it's as general and applicable and universal to as many people as possible, right? So as many ages and sizes can do this trapeze and not scrape their backside on the platform or, or whatever. It's actually really tricky. And we spent a long time, we tried a whole bunch of different structures and everything, and we poured a lot of money and time into it. And I'll never forget when it was done and, and we had it all set up in this warehouse, kind of our R&D place. And they told me it was ready, and I went in there, and we're all excited. We got our cameras ready. And I look at it, and it was this box. I'm trying to see if you can even see it. it. That's it right here. I don't have a pointer, but it was just this box with some stairs and a trapeze bar into a foam pit. And I thought, ugh. It was, like, disappointing. Like, that's it? All this time and money, and it just, it just looks so simple and basic. Like, you're just going to swing off this box into a foam pit. I can't imagine anyone's going to get super excited about that. So we, we were worried. And we're like, well, what are we going to do? And this is where, have you guys ever heard of, of uh, investment bias? Have you studied that yet? We were basically like, we've spent so much time and money on it. We've got to roll it out now. Let's not waste all the time and effort we did, so let's roll it out. We didn't have high hopes. We're like, we'll put it out there. How do you think it did? Here's what happened. I got totally surprised. It was basic, all right? But here's what else it was. It ended up being the perfect three to five second Instagram video for a mom and her kids. A little platform where the mom could stand and, and take a sideways camera video of Junior doing the trapeze into the foam pit. Per
perfect three to four second video. And based on that, it became a hit. And in fact, it, symbolic of that, that year, someone in New Orleans at our park there, the mom was filming little daughter, went and did it and didn't let go of the bar and came back and like spread eagle right back into the platform and then fell into the foam pit. She was fine. It's totally padded and everything. But the video was so good, it went on America's Funniest Home Videos, and we won Amer America's Funniest Home Videos. I mean, I didn't win it, but the video won America's Funniest Home Videos. And that's, that's what it was. It was just, it was a selfie. And so the power of the selfie drove the attraction. The attraction was lame. You guys would not be impressed. But it made for a good post. And that alone is enough to drive the success of an attraction. So now, when we add a new attraction, what do you think we're thinking about? Where's the selfie here? Where, where's the optical photo opportunity here? And, and it, you've got to be thinking this way. It seems so superficial, but you've got to be thinking of, about it this way because your customers are. I'll tell you, if you want to get into the mind of a teenage girl, right, a high school girl right now, um, and we th our marketers think this way, like, okay, should I post this tonight? I know that tomorrow I'm going to the pumpkin patch and I'm definitely going to post there with my friends. And then I also know Thursday um, we're going, you know, I have a, we're going to the game and I'm definitely going to post then. So posting tonight would probably be over posting. Maybe I'll take the picture tonight and save it for next Saturday and that would be right on cadence with what I'm trying to do, which is like, three posts a week, max, but they're good quality posts. This sounds so superficial to you, but let me tell you what, this is, this is the mindset. Like literally, this is what's going through their minds. Like, okay, they're strategizing. Everyone's a PR agent for their own life. So let me, let me give you um, some other examples. We're not the only one riding these trends, right? How many of you have been to Top Golf? Right on these trends. They're, they're fantastic. Love Top Golf, love what they're doing, and they're, you know, they're, they're a peer in this experiential world. How many of you have been to an escape room? Same thing, all right? This is totally experiential. Um, bowling. How many of you have been bowling? Hopefully, all of you. There is not a more boring, lame thing in the world to do more than bowling. Okay, but guess what? It's undergoing an incredible renaissance right now. Bowling is red hot. Uh, one of the main companies, a company called Lucky Strike, just sold for a billion dollars, all right? And everyone thought bowling was dead. To me, it will always be dead. <laughs> but, but they've started mixing it up, and they're making it like Top Golf, and you can get some good food, and there's the neon whatever bowling and whatever, and, it's experiential, and suddenly it's hot again. And um, so, one of my favorites, how many of you have been to an experiential exhibit? Experiential art exhibit. Museum of Ice Cream. One minute. one minute, okay. Color Factory, I'm a little biased. I'm actually one of the owners of Color Factory. But if you, any of you have ever been to these, guess what they are? They're selfie studios. You just literally go through, and uh, here it is. Here's Color Factory. In fact, you guys can all geo-search this later on Instagram. Search Color Factory New York, and you're going to find a million selfies of people in the yellow balls, all right, or the ribbon room, or whatever, confetti, or whatever it is. And you pay 40 bucks, and you go through here, and you just you take selfies. That's, that's what it is. And there's a six-month waiting list in New York right now to get in here. One more with my one minute. I got to tell you about this one. Another one of my favorites, okay? Hatchet throwing. How in the world can this be a business? <laughs> and other, other than this experiential world we live in. Like 20 years ago, this wouldn't have been a business. Now this is a great business. And is there any more bad A selfie than that? just wielding a battle axe and throwing it at a wall. Like that is a great three second video. So these are all part of this experiential trend. Now we, we don't have time, we're gonna wrap it up. So let me, 
a couple things. If I had more time, I'd talk to you about gamification, keeping score. If you have something that's experiential and you can find a way to put a scoreboard on it, that amps it up tenfold, okay? And I have some examples, but we're short on time. Examples even that we've done. I'd also talk to you about virtual reality. And I'd tell you that the early returns on virtual reality are in. And guess what? Meh. It's a dud. All right? Virtual reality is a dud. It's not working. The money is not there. It's something you try once and go, oh, yeah, that's kind of cool. And then you never need to do again. Um, on the other hand, augmented reality is going to be red hot. All right? And I'm going to show you, because we're hurrying, the thing that blew the cover off of this was this thing called Pokemon Go. This was the wake-up call, all right? And what you want is not virtual reality. You want augmented reality. You, you want a mix of reality and technology. That's what humans are going to want. and that, So that's what we're thinking about. That's what experiential entrepreneurs are thinking about. And a lot of it was made manifest by Pokemon Go. The Void, any of you familiar with The Void, another company here in Utah Valley, which is what we would call a mixed reality. I wish we could spend a lot more time on this. Here's my final point, and I want to go back to the Best Buy that I told you about, OK? Oh, sorry. OK. Because of Amazon, you've all heard this term, the Amazon effect. Retailers in America are closing down every year, all right? For the last 50 years, the icon of American business was this company in Arkansas, in Bentonville, called Walmart. And the model of Walmart was to build a huge box and to put as much stuff in that box as you can, and then you manage the heck out of the inventory with software and all the data tools we have now. And you could go there and get anything, anytime from that store, and the wider and broader the the SKU offering, you know, the, the number of things you sold, the better. And American retail for the last 50 years has been built on that paradigm. And, and what that has led to is the American inline retail shopping mall. Not the shopping mall, the indoor shopping mall where you go and there's all the little shops. I'm talking about the inline retail box mall. Best Buy, Sports Authority, Kmart, Target, Walmart, uh, Toys R Us, I could go on and on. That's, there's millions of square feet in America built on that model. Guess what? Amazon has destroyed that model. That model is dead, and every year, they're dying. Doot, doot, doot. And every year, guess who's benefiting from that? Circus tricks. So several years ago, when Sports Authority went out, that next year, what do you think we did? We went into like eight or nine new sports, old sports authorities with our parks. This year, anyone know where we're going this year? It's all about Babies R Us, baby. <laughs> babies R Us. We're, we're going into like 10 Babies R Us. Now we're like the first call. Best, best Buy, you better believe it. We're in like 10 Best Buys, OK? So my point on all of this is I laugh about this, and it's fun. This is actually a huge problem in America. Like this is planners, uh, politicians, leaders, business leaders, executives are struggling with this. What are we going to do with literally millions of square feet of big box retail space? And that, to me, is an entrepreneurial opportunity. So based on, on the things that we've talked about today, let me leave you with this question. Just pose this. As entrepreneurs, if you have an idea for something to do, not something to sell, but something to do in a large format that you could stick in one of those big boxes, 20,000 square feet, 25,000 square feet, you have, in my mind, you have an incredible business opportunity. There will be several billion dollar companies that solve that question, all right? What is an experiential thing that you can take selfies of, that you can do, and by the way, it can go in an old Best Buy, all right? If you can come up with those ideas, it's a, it's a billion dollar idea. Anyway, we'll end on that note, and uh, we're gonna get
Thank you. 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 Thank you.